Well, it's uh, 11 a.m., so we might as well get started. Uh, thank you all for coming along and attending today here at the Beta Shares Barbell Strategies Building Better Portfolios. Um, hope everyone's had a lovely start to the week, and look, I'm sure that uh, there's at least one Star Wars fan out there, so may the fourth be with you on that side of it. Um, let's get going. Uh, next slide is obviously that important uh, slide. Please have a, a quick read of that. Um, obviously, pointing out past performance performance is not indicative of future performance there, so uh, give that a quick read. As always, um, please do write through questions as we're going. We've got some really interesting speakers today and topics, so please write those questions as we go along. Um, there's a little widget box there, as you'll find on the right-hand side, so we will answer those at the end. There'll be plenty of time for Q&A. A quick update from BetaShares um, for those who are attending their first webinar or and also for our advisors that have been supporting us over the years. Uh, BetaShares, we are the only Australian founded ETF fund manager and we are currently managing around $17.3 billion. So thank you so much for all your support with our current investors over the years. Um, and that's across a range of strategies with over 63 different ETFs um, that we have listed on the market. Um, along with our dynamic and strategic model portfolios as well. But thank you for your support. Um, what are we going to be covering today? Oh, wait, before that. And also, please look to register for any content. Uh, we have a heap of advisor-centric support material that comes out every week. So do pop on our website there and register your email. And also follow us across those different social media um, outlets in terms of LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. So today's speakers, we are very lucky, as I mentioned before, to have two very uh, well-known speakers in David Bassanese, our Chief Economist. Thank you so much for joining us today, David. And also Cameron Gleeson, our Senior Investment Specialist. Uh, myself, I'm Chris Yates. Um, I'm one of the directors here at Beta Shares on the advisor business part, um, looking after New South Wales and ACT. So hopefully some of my advisors are logged in today as well. So the agenda, what are we going to be covering? Uh, David will be giving an economic update, uh, giving you a little bit of insight on terms of markets um, and what's happening on that side of it. Cam will be then covering what are some of the current challenges in portfolio construction and also introducing the barbell approach to portfolio construction. So giving some insight in terms of how advisors and asset allocators now can actually utilise different types of ETFs, be it passive, um, smart beta, active, or sector specific, to actually build better robust portfolios through those ETF selection, and also going through the actual implementation. How do you implement those within a portfolio? And as mentioned before, we do have um, some time for some questions and answers at the end, so do write them through as we go. Right, I think that's me done. Uh, David, over to you, mate. Thanks very much, Chris, and great to be with you all today uh, for the the webinar. So, um, as as um, as Chris mentioned, uh, I'm just going to like offer a scene setter, I guess, in terms of the um, economic outlook, the situation at the moment. Um, I will be giving a a more detailed uh, webinar in terms of the economy uh, in a few weeks' time. You may have got an email about that. That's our regular quarterly economic and market uh, webinar. So, um, again, this is just a, a scene setter. Um, for the, the barbell discussion um, and uh, just be talking for around about 10 minutes or so. So to, just with that, let me um, just begin um, on the first slide. And really this is to just to think about where we are with, with COVID. Um, and what this is, the orange line there is the ratio of ec global equity performance vis-a-vis -vis bond performance. So when that line's going up, it basically means equities are outperforming bonds. Uh, the the grey areas are US recessions. So, uh, and again, as you may know, in the US, there's a group that date when recessions begin and end to the month. Uh, we are in an, a US recession. They called that that it did begin in February last year. As yet, the, the that group, the National Bureau of Economic Research, haven't said that recession has ended. I suspect the recession will 
has ended, well, I think it has likely ended and, and they will make that announcement, the recession ended. And when they make that announcement, they'll probably say it ended sometime uh, late last year. But anyway, no announcement being made. But the point about this slide is really just to think about cycles. And really, as you see, between recessions, we have expansions nat naturally. And typically through expansion periods, you get equities outperforming bonds. And so we think about the US going into recession, it was the shortest, sharpest recession in US history. Um, because the downturn in the economy, um, you know, because of COVID was pretty short and sharp. Um, so I guess the way to think about COVID and the situation now is we are in a new cycle. If you look at it, the last two cycles ended uh, and the recessions began when that unemployment rate got to pretty low levels, around about four, three and a half percent. And at the moment, the unemployment rate has come in a lot, but it's still, this is the US unemployment rate, I should point out. Uh, at around about six, five and a bit, uh, you know, high fives, uh, it's still um, well above the full employment rate. So it means that we're in this expansion phase and we can, you know, the US economy, the global economy continue to grow uh, at above trend pace before we need to see uh, monetary policy tightening um, that, that, you know, might typically, you know, end up causing the end of the cycle. So. Bottom line, we're in this sweet spot of the early stage of a new cycle where generally you would think equity markets can uh, outperform uh, bonds. Now, one of the challenges for the market, you know, and again, just from looking at that, that slide, that's true, but you all, all, you do get pullbacks in the market. So basically the biggest debt declines in underperformance of equities versus bonds tend to happen during US recessions. Now, even during expansion periods, you, you can get pullbacks in the market. Uh, and one of the reasons for those pullbacks is when central banks do begin to take away the punch bowl, do begin to uh, start tightening. Uh, and one, I guess one challenge uh, going forward may be when interest rates do start to back up in a big way. If you look at the equity risk premium, uh, sorry, the price to earnings ratio for the market, uh, now quite elevated in the US, but it's true globally, uh, around just over 20 times earnings. Uh, now, to some extent, that is still justified by the very low level of interest rates. If you look at the equity risk premium uh, for the US market, so that's the earnings yield of the market. So the PE ratio turned on its head, you get the equity risk premium. You take away the, the bond yield, 10-year uh, bond yield in this case, you get this relative measure of valuation. As you can see, that's come in now and it's actually back at its 55-year average. So it's certainly tighter by the standards of the past decade, um, but from a longer run perspective, certainly from the standards of the 80s and 90s, it's still uh, certainly above those levels. Um, uh, but so I guess the point here is that valuations are okay, uh, provided we don't get a you know big backup in bond yields uh, anytime soon. Um, so that, uh, and again, my, my view as, 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 I'll, as I'll explain is that we won't get that uh, for a while yet. That it will eventually happen when the Federal Reserve starts raising interest rates, but I think it's premature to start worrying about that at the moment. Um, and I'll just touch on that in, in a second. Um, I guess just in terms of that expansion, I guess the one, again, this is a slide to just think about the cycles that we've been going through over the past few decades. Um, and the, the dotted line in both of those charts is the, the relative performance of the global mining sector, the equity mining sector, versus the technology sector. Uh, and as you can see, uh, in the late 1990s, mining underperformed technology. Uh, then we had a major period of, uh, you know, the commodity boom, the China commodity boom, where uh, the mining resources stocks outperformed technology uh, for, for a long period. Uh, and then come the GFC and the, um, the you know, the boom in, in technology, the FANG stocks in particular, uh, the commodity prices coming off. We've had a, a, a basically a tech boom number two where technology has outperformed um, um, resources. And um, as, uh, as Cameron will touch on a little bit, this also plays into this growth versus value uh, dynamic. And um, what we've seen uh, over the decades is a, is a changing of the guard in terms of areas of performance. So, Value areas are often areas like uh, resources, um, and they have tended to under, you know, so they've had a periods of outperformance and underperformance. But essentially, since the GFC, we've been in this growth uh, dynamic where the tech sector has uh, been outperforming, or technology in particular, outperforming mining. Now, the point of that chart is to show you that over those periods, that you it actually does help to explain the relative performance of the Australian market. Uh, versus global markets and ex explain the performance of the US dollar uh, versus the Australian dollar as well. So that one sort of growth versus 
value, you know, resources boom versus technology boom, uh, it, it has been a major driver over the past couple of decades. And if you can basically get that call right, if you want to try to make that call, it can help colour your your thinking in terms of asset allocation. And for my money, I think on a sustained basis over the next few years, uh, we will see a continuation of that relative performance of, of tech over, over resources. Um, so that favours global markets over Australian markets, uh, favours an Aussie dollar not going up a lot further from where we are at the moment. But again, that, that's to put it in context. But if, you know, again, if you there are other ways to play it, but if you do want to make those decisions, uh, that's the sort of key way I, I kind of think about global uh, global thematics. What can go wrong with the markets at the moment? So obviously there's a COVID issue and there's an economic issue. In terms of COVID, you know, new what we don't want to see at the moment, things are looking good. I mean, uh, vaccines are rolling out. Um, US has has gone through its third wave of cases and that's come down. Um, what we don't want to see is new variants emerge that are immune to the current vaccines and or the vaccines have serious side effects. And at this stage, at least, you know, fingers crossed uh, not that those ca that hasn't happened. So the variants that have emerged uh, are still capable of being tackled by the vaccine and the side effects, particularly in the case of the AstraZeneca um, uh, vaccine where blood clotting can emerge, it's still seen as a very, very small risk um, and, you know, and so not a barrier to the, to the rollout of, of, of the vaccines. Economic risks are the inflation and interest rate story. As I said, you know, if interest rates were to back up in a big way in the short run, that would put immediate pressure on equity valuations um, and you would get an equity market uh, correction. Other issues, you know, what Biden is doing with regard to tax and regulation, um, we'll see that he's proposing corporate tax increases uh, in the US. Um, again, I think even if you do get corporate tax increases in the US, it's not going to derail the economic recovery. Uh, it may be a cause for a setback in the markets, but certainly not a you know onset of recession or anything like that. And the other one, you know, we need to keep a you know a ongoing watch on is US-China tensions and um, and how that plays out. And uh, that certainly seems to be a simmering uh, ongoing issue. But again, I don't think either side really wants to escalate things to a point where it would threaten their economic recovery. Just on that, the inflation story, as you can see here, I mean, I, I'm, I, there's a lot of talk about inflation breaking out because of the strong rebound in, in global growth, uh, particularly in the US. Look, we've had expansions in the past going back, uh, you know, 30 odd years. And as you can see, US inflation has been pretty dormant uh, since the mid 1990s. And I see no reason why that would necessarily change uh, anytime soon. You may get an uptick in the short run. Um, and one of the reasons being that inflation really did collapse uh, this time last year because of COVID. Um, and as those sort of base effects unwind, so that's helped push down the annual rate, but as that, that those one-off effects um, uh, come out of the annual calculation, you get, you're gonna get an uptick in the annual rate. But thereafter, that uh, inflation should um, ease back again um, uh, to, to, to sort of, you know, the low uh, two, actually back below 2%. At the moment, core inflation in the US is under 2%. There's a risk it could up, uh, uptick to above 2% over the next couple of months, but I think the markets are getting comfortable with the idea that that is only going to be a short run uh, of feature. And just on interest rates, um, this is just a chart to show you that basically when I think about US interest rates, or interest, the key variables are the US federal funds rate, and what the market expects that funds rate to do over the following 12 months. And at the moment, the market is, is getting more comfortable with the idea the Fed won't be raising rates for 12 months. If you look at that dotted line, it's not pricing in any tightening. If that were to go above the grey line, it would mean the markets were pricing in Fed, Fed tightening over the following 12 months. And on that basis, my modelling suggests 10-year bond yields should remain below 2% in the US over the next, uh, you know, throughout the rest of this year. And an example of, of a similar situation was back, as you can see in the grey area there, 2012-13, where the market was comfortable with the idea the Fed wasn't raising rates. And as you can see over that period, rates did average uh, below 2%. So that's the um, situation. Um, again, I'll, I'll elaborate on a lot, particularly with regard to the Australian economy um, and some uh, in, uh, investment ideas arising out of all of that in, in, in my uh, bigger quarterly economic webinar uh, later this uh, in, a, in a few weeks' time. But for the for the moment, I'll hand over to my colleague Cameron, who's going to 
talk about the barbell approach and um, yeah, some challenges in uh, managing portfolios. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, David and, and Chris, for, for introducing us. Uh, so, yeah, in, in light of what uh, what David said, I'm going to um, to talk about you know the you know in the backdrop of the economic environment and some of the risk factors, portfolio construction, and an approach which has some real applicability in the current environment. The number one question that, that, that David and we're being asked really is about, you know, are we in a strong reflationary environment? Uh, what does that mean for interest rates? Um, we get questions about what's happening to prices of, of global equities, uh, shipping rates. Are we seeing supply side shocks or is this part of a more sustained long term trend? What does this mean for equity markets? And we can see on the chart here how over the last 12 months growth had str was strongly outperforming. Uh, but more recently, we've seen a rebound in, in value. Um, similarly, in, you know, in, in fixed income, uh, we saw a you know pretty substantive sell-off uh, in in February. Rates now seem to have stabilised. What's the path path forward for fixed income? And David's, of course, presented a you know a very you know robust base case for the path forward. But it certainly does feel like we're at an important juncture in markets, and and a sense that maybe with some of the factors at play, this time is different. So, you know, it's, it's obviously important that we're able to understand the implications of, of economic information and how they impact financial markets. But what's crucial as asset allocators is how we then use that information. And the danger is of a real sort of reactionary, uh, you know, reactionary sort of view on, on the current news cycle. We do see a lot of uh, asset allocators who will express a particular view across all parts of their portfolio. And the risk in trying to time markets in this way is that you leave yourself exposed to an unanticipated scenario. Uh, now, we know as humans that we have actually a high level of overconfidence of our ability to predict the future. Um, financial markets are extremely complicated, complicated systems with exogenous shocks. Um, you know, Nassim Taleb, who's written a number of well-known finance books, including Fooled by Randomness and The Black Swan, has talked extensively about this. So, so knowing we're really bad at, at predicting the future, you know, how do we want to build, build portfolios? We should be planning for you know, a range of scenarios. We need to make sure our portfolios sit in a position of strength in a range of potential outcomes, not just for the view that we think is most likely. Um, and just because you know we don't have that ability to, to crystal ball doesn't necessarily mean we want to outsource the problem to an active manager or just default into a broad market passive approach. And I'll go through some of the challenges there. But the, I mean, the good news uh, is that while we're not necessarily good at picking the market cycle, we do, for a given point in the cycle, we do have a reasonable understanding of how particular asset classes and investments will perform. So for example, if we're in an early stage recovery, we know what types of stocks are likely to lead the market. And this can certainly help us in building robust portfolios. So I'll talk briefly about active managers. The chart here shows data from the SPIVA Australian scorecard. So S&P uh, measure the performance of all active managers uh, in this country versus passive benchmarks. And the one year time horizon shows the performance proportion of active managers across categories that manage to outperform uh, their relative benchmarks across fund categories. So the majority of, of managers have in fact underperformed their benchmarks in 2020, which is obviously disappointing because we've been told for years that 2020 was exactly the type of volatile environment where an active manager should be a benchmark approach. Of course, you know, if we look across the longer term trend, we look at time horizons out to three, five, even 15 years, we see that the number of active managers outperforming decreases even further. Um, and, and obviously, you know, most disappointingly, the, the, the largest categories here in terms of assets under management are that Australian equities general category or broad market Australian equities and international equities. And in that space, less than 20% of active managers have managed to outperform over a five year time horizon. So, you know, if the active guys uh, can't beat the benchmark, then, you know, do we want to just adopt a low cost uh, benchmark tracking approach? 
Well, but before doing that, we need to look at the characteristics of broad market indices and make sure that they're actually adding value to our portfolios. The data here goes back to 1980 and just talks to the fact that there are you know, issues in terms of what diversification you're getting from broad market benchmarks. So this shows drawdowns of the MISCI Australia Index, which is in grey, versus the MISCI USA Index in orange. These are two broad market ben uh, benchmarks that have a very long track record of time, uh, time history. So, you know, and what we see pre-GFC is that the drawdowns are not necessarily as synchronised, but also the magnitude of the drawdowns is certainly not aligned. Um, if we look at the, the 1982 drawdown in Australia, pretty substantial drawdown, drawdown around about 40% versus the US, um, you know, sort of closer to mid-teens in terms of the drawdown experience there. And then, of course, if we think back to the dot-com crash, that impacted America, you know, substantially uh, in the early 2000s. Um, and the way that that played out and the economic ramifications for Australia were far more muted. Um, so as a result, blending US equities with Australian equities gave you know, a reasonable diversification benefit, correlation there at 0.5. Post GFC, we've seen greater global integration, greater integration of capital markets, and that central bank stimulus from central banks around the world driving the price of risk assets. And while that's generally been good for the valuations, it has meant that they tend to move in lockstep. And we can see that in the chart and the correlation there, 0.76. Further than that, we can look within, uh, within market capitalization indices and see that the composition's actually not necessarily stable over time. We do see periods of, if you like, bubble behavior within indices. This shows the sector breakdown, a couple of key sectors within the S&P, index and market capitalization weighted index over time. And we see, you know, the lead up to the, to the uh, dot com crash, you know, the, the, the rapid build up in, in uh, IT within the overall index. You know, a slower but, but as significant build up in financials in the lead up to the GFC. And then again, in the lead up to COVID, we see the technology related sectors have really increased their share of the overall market. And it's points of time like this that you, you want to watch out for. Possibly even more stark in terms of that composition of the S&P 500 is just to look at the top five stock holdings. So the grey uh, shaded area here shows the proportion of the S&P 500, which the top five stocks represent at any one point in time. Um, and that currently sits around about 23% in the top five names. Um, so that's a very acute level of concentration. Those, those stocks are all tech related stocks. So all in the same sector and concentration levels not seen since uh, the 1970s. So it really does, does pay to consider whether this exposure is giving you real diversification benefits at the current point in time. Just a slightly different point is about how markets have evolved since the GFC. The chart here, a bit of a technical chart, but shows the volatility of the VIX index, so the volatility of volatility. And look, without you know, going through the technicalities, the point here is that the rate of change in volatility, moving from a high volatility regime to a low volatility change uh, regime, is increasing. Um, we can just think about last year, the number of cycles we had compressed into a 12 month period was extreme. You know, we initially had bullish conditions, fastest bear market in history, fastest recovery, uh, and then a number of other cycles, including very strong risk on environment um, at the end of the year. The issue for someone trying to time the market is not only trying to predict the direction of the market, but trying to implement changes in a portfolio in a timely manner. So you're picking the upside. Um, and so that's just become increasingly hard. So what we want to present today is an approach which offers an alternative. Uh, and addresses some of these challenges, which is a barbell investment strategy. The, a barbell investment strategy or a bar, barbell strategy was, is a term which was first coined by Nassim Taleb to describe investing in the extremes without, if you like, the pollution or the corruption of the middle of the road choices. Specifically, we look to invest in volatile or risky assets which each seek exposure to different investment factors. The idea is that these investment factors have low or zero correlation 
meaning that the two, two assets we're invested in complement each other and give better overall portfolio outcomes. And we've seen that over market cycles, this can produce stronger and more robust performance than your sort of market capitalization all weather portfolio can deliver. Specifically, we look across market cycles by if you preserve you know, balanced, uh, robust exposure to competing investment factors, we can avoid some of the, if you like, the skews or the, the bubbles that we see in large market cap weighted indices. But I think the critical point is that at these points where we feel like the market could go one way or another, these unpredictable times in markets, that's where a barbell strategy can really uh, play a role. What we will see and what we aim to build is portfolios where the upside on the, on the side of the barbell that, that, that wins, if you like, is far greater than the downside on, on the other side of the barbell. So this is a, you know, in finance you call this convexity, positive skew or positive asymmetry. Um, and so we don't necessarily know, we don't necessarily want to choose, we don't, we don't know which side of the barbell will win, but we're aiming to see you know, positive outcomes on the overall, from the overall perspective. Uh, no matter which way the market moves. So, so obviously we need to think about well, how do we build a barbell approach? And the first, you know, port of, port of call or the, you know, the, the most obvious place to look right now uh, is growth versus value, which are really seen as you know, opposing views in terms of investing in equities. Growth equities uh, are obviously harnessing long-term structural trends. So the opposite really of, of leveraging the short-term economic cycle. We're talking about emerging companies versus established industries, very future focused versus you know, learning from the past. Uh, but uh, another point we make is that the growth equities are sometimes called long duration equities. And the reason for that is because of their, their earnings profiles mean that the valuations are driven uh, by the discount rate we apply to those earnings profiles. So when bond yields, uh, or, or inflation falls, the valuations of these long duration growth assets tend to improve, which is the opposite of value or cyclical stocks, which tend to benefit from a, an economic reflationary period. You know, more broadly, we can look across asset classes uh, and we look to see how assets behave in relation to changing expectations in economic growth, which we show here on the diagram as the y-axis, Versus, uh, versus inflation expectations as shown on the x-axis. Uh, and we've categorized different asset classes in the four quadrants, which are clearly very different market regimes. So we saw that, that growth sits in the top left versus value top right. Uh, but yeah, obviously we can, we can look across these asset classes across the barbell and combine different components from different quadrants. We'll go through some examples as to how you might implement a barbell strategy using beta shares, uh, beta shares funds, just to give some concrete examples. So the first um, space to look at would be international equities. And we show here uh, ASX codes of, of beta shares funds, which sit in international equities within that growth barbell side there on the left-hand side and value or reflation um, equity uh, exposures in on on the right hand side there. Just for you know the first step as a simple example, we, we, we've done what, what I describe here is a U.S. equity barbell, which is really to combine the Nasdaq 100 ETF, those you know dominant U.S. tech companies, very strong growth profiles, with exposure to cyclical equities that are likely to benefit from uh, from an economic uh, you know reopening, and, and those exposures are best captured in our beta shares S&P 500 equal weight ETF. We can see um, underneath the barbell, the drivers of these two exposures, uh, you know, inflation uh, or secular growth versus cyclical growth, large size versus small size, momentum versus mean reversion. So these are excellent exposures to pair together. To show the outcome of this, and we, we can show this over various time horizons, but I've shown it over a very long time horizon to capture various market cycles. We, we can see the performance of the NASDAQ 100 index in, in light gray, uh, and then the, the um, S&P 500 equal weight shown in, in the lighter, lighter orange. And then finally, of course, down the bottom, we see the S&P 500 uh, market cap index shown in, in black, 
but the, the blended or the barbell portfolio there is shown in, in orange. Now, what have we done by combining these two assets? Well, the predominant driver of, 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 of really risk adjusted returns is the complementing strategies driving down your blended volatility. So the volatility is far lower than the average of the two component parts. And as a result, we see the sharp ratio, which is really your risk adjusted returns, is actually better than either of the two uh, component underlyings and far better than the overall market. Another way of thinking about this is that over this time period, we've got a return profile, which is not dissimilar to the NASDAQ 100, which has performed very strongly while preserving a level of volatility much closer to the, the broad market. And look, this is a, a, a you know an important strategy because we know a lot of investors over the last five years when growth has performed very strongly, have allocated heavily to growth. Um, and given that we might be at a point in the cycle where the worm is turning, barbelling by adding in a complementary exposure, like a cyclical or value exposure, can certainly help round out portfolios and protect us from a, you know really a regime change. Also shown here an Australian equity growth value barbell. So I've selected X20, our beta shares Australian X20 portfolio diversifier ETF. In the Australian market, the growth portion of the market is really represented by the, the mid cap portion of the market, which is different to the US where it's the mega cap names. Uh, and so X20 has obviously exposure to uh, secular growth, smaller size and momentum. Uh, from the value section, I've selected QOZ, which is a index tracking fund, which uses a, an approach called fundamental indexing to weight the top 200 Australian equities by their fundamental economic size, as opposed to using market cap, um, and doesn't take into account the growth profile, earnings growth prof profile of these companies. So as a result, QOZ gives you a, a dynamic tilt to value and also to mean reversion over time. So these are very much anchored in the value and the cyclical camp. Now, over various periods of time, each of these exposures has underperformed, but we show over a 20 year period, the combination of both, again, has led to, to you know, very strong outperformance. And it's not always the case that the barbell sharp ratio will be higher than the sharp ratio of each individual components. But we always, we've found that in each case, it's higher than the average sharp ratio. But in either case, we've managed to capture that growth element through X20, as well as having that, that dynamic tilt to value, which has now performed very strongly over the last six months. And our sharp ratio, our risk adjusted returns, much higher than the broad market exposure. This is a, you know, a little bit of a you know, more nuanced or a larger you know, sort of uh, you know, exercise in terms of building portfolios, but we've, we wanted to construct an international equity barbell to mirror the MISCI world country weights. So, so to show that we can be geographically diversified in line with MISCI world, while specifically pulling out value and, and growth exposures uh, and we can see that the names and the weights of ETFs used to build this barbell strategy shown here. Uh, for example, we previously mentioned S&P 500 equal weight, but, but also funds, for example, our Europe ETF, our FTSE 100 ETF and our Japan ETF to ensure that we're uh, you know, geographically matching MISCI world. So if we look at the return profile of this globally diversified value growth barbell, we see, look, what I'd suggest is a very pleasing outcome. The consistency of the outperformance of this barbell um, you know, is excellent. This shows track record back to the common inception of, of uh, all the underlying indices of these ETFs. 2016 was the only year when this barbell actually underperformed uh, the MISCI World uh, Index itself. So again, just showing how we can build an overall global exposure using that barbell approach. And that, that is obviously, you know, a, a you know multi-fund portfolio. A lot of, uh, you know, a lot of what we talk about is, you know, obviously building that whole portfolio approach. But we don't necessarily need to, you know, go that that complex. Often, you know, investors are looking to add a single exposure into what they already hold, and we can use a barbell approach to, to look at that too. A lot of 
investors don't necessarily have a dedicated exposure to emerging markets. And so the default might be to use the, the broad, broad emerging market index, which the, bench, the, the, the standard index for that is the MISCI emerging market index. Our Asia Technology Tigers ETF offers an alternative, which I think is very appealing for Australian investors. The Asian Technology Tigers uh, ETF, which uh, has the ticker code Asia, tracks that Asia index of the 50 of the largest technology and e-commerce companies throughout emerging market Asia. And what it adds to an Australian investor is sector diversification. So 50% of the Australian equity market is financials and materials. We don't need to pick the areas, we don't need to add uh, emerging market banks, we don't need to add emerging market iron ore miners from Brazil. We need to make up areas where the Australian equity market is weak, those growth sectors, uh, communication services, IT, consumer discretionary. We can see down the bottom the correlation of MISCI World versus, uh, versus uh, the uh, ASX 200. That roughly halves by using Asia as opposed to that broad market index. And as a result, the overall outcome in terms of risk adjusted returns, you know, very strong outcome from strategically adding a single complementary exposure to our Australian equities. So we show here a blend of 50% Asia with ASX 200 versus 50% MISCI World versus ASX 200, um, giving us what Australia really lacks, Australia being very much a growth or, or, or cyclical uh, index. So adding that growth element. Fixed income, I'll talk briefly about a very simple example of fixed income barbells. So, you know, we've talked about this previously, but we know that broad market fixed income benchmarks have been very much influenced by central bank behaviour uh, and stimulus um, in terms of you know, trying to, to really, um, you know, support the, the overall economy. And that means that broad market fixed income benchmarks and, and the fixed income benchmark in Australia, the Osborne Composite, uh, have been influenced in a way that means they're not necessarily so powerful as tools to act as you know, defensive elements to our overall portfolio. We can choose more targeted exposure to fixed income that is likely to give us a, you know, a much stronger outcome. And one way of doing that is rather than just holding the whole fixed income market in Australia in a, in a broad market industry, we can pair, for example, long duration or, or you know, longer term high quality uh, government bonds. For example, AGBT, our Australian, uh, Australian government bond ETF, with really short duration fixed income. And for this example, we've chosen the Australian uh, you know, cash uh, ETF. So, so this is essentially an ETF holding cash at a bank. The idea is that we're holding fixed income at, at either end of the spectrum in terms of time to maturity, and we're cutting out that middle bit of the curve, the bit that's been really manipulated um, as a result of central bank intervention. By doing this, and, and what I've shown here is rather than just showing a 50-50 barbell, I've shown how we can actually blend different allocations to, to cash or AAA with government bonds AGBT to, to match whatever duration, or whatever sensitivity interest rates profile we want. But in doing so, we can match the Osborne Composite duration, average duration, while giving us a higher expected return in terms of yield and roll, um, and also a high credit quality. So this is a, you know, using this approach will mean we have a portfolio, higher credit quality generally means we've got a better, uh, better equity diversification tool. Beyond that, you know, if we've got a view on duration, we can also go use these two tools to go longer duration than, than the benchmark, or go shorter duration, take a tactical view, while improving diversification benefits if we like, or really you know, shortening that duration, but matching the expected return or the yield of the Osborne Composite. So it's really about using building blocks to be more efficient within fixed income. But you know, more broadly, you know, it's, it's important to think about fixed income in the context of your equities. Um, and so within our, our diagram here, and, and thinking about how fixed income behaves, there's really two key components or drivers of fixed income returns. That's uh, duration or term premium, which is represented here at the bottom left. The long-term government bonds really represents that, that duration element of fixed income. And the other element is, of course, credit premium, which we get from, from corporate credit, which sits in the top right component of, of or quadrant of the chart. 
So, you know, credit's interesting. Credit used to be uh, really uncorrelated with equities up until around about the late 90s. Then over time, as corporates have become more and more indebted, the correlation between credit and equities has, has increased. Uh, you know, to a level where we've, you know, we've got a question how we build portfolios, including credit. I've got growth here. So if we've got an investor who is fundamentally a growth equity investor, they're tilted towards growth within their equities. Well, growth has exposure or has a level of correlation to equities because they're obviously, if credit's correlated to equities, growth is still equities, but also has an element of duration. So there's an element of that, you know, exposure to, to, to you know, bond yields. But because it's got that element of, of, of you know, exposure to bond yields, we can therefore afford to tilt to credit within this portfolio. So we can blend or increase the weight to credit. Now, this obviously depends on particular circumstances and weights within portfolios, but it does point to how we can use different quadrants and work across fixed income and, and, uh, and equities. Take the value investor, someone who, who's overweight value um, in terms of their equities, Credit is particularly correlated to value. I mean, they both sit within that same value reflation segment. They're both going to perform very similarly in, in, in similar market conditions. They need to be thinking about prioritizing, uh, you know, you, you high quality, uh, you know, long, longer duration bonds in order to create that, that barbell approach. The danger of going into credit when you're a value investor is that they, they move together. And what we see is that, excuse me, the mouse is just pausing here. There we go, sorry about that. What we see is an environment where credit is performing and we show three periods over the last 10 years, reflationary periods where credit's performing. The cyclical equity side of, of, of your portfolio, if you're a value investor, you know, has outsized returns. So we show HJPN index, which is our Hedge Japan index, BNK, BNKS index, which is our, our global banks ETF, index and they've performed very strongly at the same time period as credit. So we don't necessarily need to see, uh, you know, exposures to credit performing in an environment where we've already got that cyclical el um, equity element, which is going to give us that, that outsized um, upside, if you like. And to talk to that from a barbell perspective, if you are a value investor, we want to think about well, what are we blending? And so we've, we've constructed a, a globally diversified equity portfolio, which is skewed towards value and we've blended that here with a long duration uh, long duration fixed income portfolio made this a balanced portfolio matching uh, the equities from a, a you know global perspective uh, and also matching on a duration perspective global and Australian equities to to a, a balanced benchmark we show here that this is a period where you know as Dave mentioned earlier the last 10 years have been an incredible run for growth equities but despite this, that combination of value equities and long duration fixed income has actually delivered out performance over and above benchmark. So that's a, you know extremely pleasing outcome for a segment of of equities which was uh, which was but long been you know quite benign. So in closing, you know what do we what do we look for when we're building barbells? Well, it's important to to find uh, you know assets or exposures that have really well understood um, you know behaviours or performance um, in terms of their risk factors. Single stocks are not necessarily great for building barbells. There's, there's too much single stock risk. That's too unpredictable. But ETFs offer an excellent tool because they're rules-based transparent. They have you know, very predictable behaviours in certain market conditions. We're seeking a symmetry and, and we're seeking assets that are going to combine such that when one draws down, the other one is going to run up by, by a greater amount. And this does, you know, raise one point in terms of investor psychology. You know, we've, we've been in a world where all assets have been slowly inflated by central bank intervention. We need to be comfortable in a barbell approach that one component may experience a broad drawdown, but the point being that's there because we don't know which direction the markets are going. And ideally the other side of our barbell is outperforming to give us an overall stronger portfolio, portfolio outcome. Um, so, I'll hand back to Chris now, and I think we'll we'll take some Q and A.
Excellent. Thank you so much, Cam, for covering that. And also thank you, David, for the economic update as well. So we have had a couple of questions come through and please do write any additional ones um, while we answer these ones here. So look, the first question we've got is, um, why does a barbell outperform in a volatile market if it does? Um, and if that is so, if that is the case, does that mean it would underperform when we see low volatility? Um, Cam, do you want to take that one? Yep. Yeah. Great. Um, so, look, a good question. It's it's you know a barbell you know is excellent is is a you know obviously a very timely exposure right now because where we sit in the cycle and the possibility that things could go one of two ways. We do see periods where um, you know there are is low qual sorry low low you know a low volati volatility regime where a barbell does outperform. Um, but typically that does mean that one side of your barbell is driving overall returns. So for example, if we took that US equity barbell, over the last five years, the majority of the returns had been driven by the, the NASDAQ exposure as opposed to uh, the S&P 500 equal weight. So look, it, you know, if you had a crystal ball and you knew that the NASDAQ was going to perform strongly over, over a five or a 10 year period, you'd just allocate to that growth side of the barbell, even though, you know, like we, we obviously, you know, we want, we're talking about trying to build robust portfolios. If you, if you knew that was the case, that's what, that's the way you'd go. The point is because we don't know that that's the asset that will outperform, the blend of the two is likely to give you that upsize return because the upside in, in NASDAQ in a low volatility environment was greater than, than if you like the underperformance in uh, S&P 500 equal weight. Perfect, thank you, Cam. Um, just got another question come through, and maybe David, you can ask, answer this one. It's just the thoughts on India in terms of exposure. Uh, well, uh, ordinarily, uh, yeah, I mean, I think India is a great exposure. It's like a, 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 an up and coming emerging market. Um, it's, uh, you know, very good demographics on its side. Um, I've made, in the past made comparisons with, Ch I mean, China, you know, is also, you know, a very, you know, strong emerging market. I mean, just to compare uh, India with China, the, the demographics are favouring India, a uh, younger population, high birth rate. Um, it's got a lower average GDP per capita, so there's actually even more development uh, potential ahead of it. It's already a democracy. Um, well, it is a democracy. Um, and so, you know, that that risk, of, that political risk associated with, you know, potential changes in, in political system uh, not to say it's necessarily going to happen in China anytime soon, but at least it's it's a risk that you know India doesn't face, um, and it's obviously you know it speaks English, um, is you know very broad, uh, widely spoken, and and it's basically taking on a lot of um, uh, global service uh, functions, uh, so it does bode well. Um, obviously, at the moment, it's being particularly hard hit, hard hit by COVID, um, but as a as a long term uh, investment thematic, and again, yeah, we have an ETF that does provide that exposure, the um, India Quality uh, ETF, and you know we we did create that for that very reason, for that um, growth potential uh, in in India, and and arguably, you know, not to be too um, uh, cold cold blooded about it, but I mean, I guess you know the very bad situation in India with regard to COVID at the moment, um, you know, can uh, I, I think when when India does you know eventually get on top of COVID um, with, with with you know eventual rollout of vaccines, I'm not saying it's going to happen anytime soon. Um, to, that could be a, you know we're, it, it may be presenting a good buying opportunity at the moment given the um, you know the very bad situation it's facing uh, with, with regard to COVID. Excellent. Another question here. Um, this one's for you, Cam. I think uh, what portions should you hold on each side of the barbell, which is, is very interesting. Mm. Yeah, look, it, it, it's a good question. Uh, the the examples that that we've shown here today in in the webinar, uh, they're obviously you know we're using a blank sheet of paper, um, and generally speaking, with a simple uh, if you like one asset across each side of the barbell, we've we've used a fifty percent allocation to each. Uh, but you know, we we talk to clients a lot, and we know that people already have existing exposures in their portfolios. They might already have a growth manager, um, they might have some some value exposures, for example. Um, and so it's not necessarily a case that we have to adopt a 50-50 balance in order to, to have that barbell contribute. Um, any incremental um, change can help. So um, we, we certainly see people adopting a 50-50 approach, but also um, you know just adding some complementary exposure to give you 
some protection for a scenario that, that you're you're not necessarily predicting. Perfect. Thanks, Cam. Right, got a bit of a doozy here. Um, maybe DB, you can you can answer this or both is. Um, how do we ensure client portfolios hold sufficient defensive assets to address sequencing risk, which is obviously a, a key thing within portfolio construction? Yet yeah, address the low return expectations in the in the coming five years. So who wants to go first on that one? Uh, look, there's no easy answer. I mean, obviously, the problem with the moment, with the way central banks have uh, conducted policy, cash rates are very, very low. Bond yields are, uh, you know, very, very low. So traditional cash and fixed income returns aren't offering you uh, what they used to offer. And, you know, there's no getting around that. There's various, you know, funds that offer various sort of black box solutions um, out there that are offering good, good, um, you know, argue, you know, they, they claim good returns for low volatility, um, but, you know, I, I would just caution about being aware, you know, not the, the many of these sort of ideas lack uh, transparency. You're not quite sure how they're doing it and, you know, what risks they are actually taking. Um, now, I guess a couple of ideas, I mean, within the traditional domains, I mean, long duration bonds, I mean, certainly, I mean, our credit fund, for example, our cred ETF, uh, it is uh, does offer corporate bonds, but the long duration corporate bonds. Uh, and as a result, if when you get an equity market pullback or a risk off event, um, although credit spreads widen, which ordinarily hurts um, uh, corporate bonds, uh, in the, historically the 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 fact that bond yields tend to decline uh, when equities sell off has more than offset that sort of negative impact on on the that, that credit fund. So there's an example that's offering you know still reasonable yield, um, three ish percent um, for a bond exposure. Um, still above cash and does offer some defensive qualities um, when um, when equities sell off. Now, not as much as, say, a government bond would, um, but again, the government bond typically would offer you a, a lower yield. Another one, again, we've just brought out a, a hybrids fund. We have an actively managed hybrids fund, HBRD, uh, and we've also now brought out a passively managed uh, major bank hybrids fund, um, which uh, it, gives you that pure hybrid exposure uh, at an at a, at a even lower cost. And the beauty of hybrids, I mean, is that they offer you know, good yield uh, and also good defensive, typically, certainly compared to equities uh, in, an, in a risk off environment, typically around about one third the, um, the downside, you know, historically we've seen relative to, relative to equities. Um, the GFC being a special ex uh, exception where, the, I mean, they even in the GFC hybrids did sell off, but nowhere near what, what equities have done. Uh, and certainly more recently, hybrids have held up very, very well when equities have, have sold off. So that's another sort of intermediate risk uh, type exposure, somewhere between cash and traditional bonds or, or between bonds, traditional bonds and, and equities. Cam, did you have anything you want yeah, to add? Yeah, look, I mean, I, I'd probably just add that, um, you know, I think those are all excellent building blocks to consider in your portfolio. It's very much a case of, uh, you know, portfolio by portfolio in terms of, um, you know, what you need to blend in, into your overall asset mix. You know, we, we showed that uh, the diagram, the, the four quadrants before. It's important to make sure that you don't end up with a portfolio. And this can be can be tricky when performance in particular assets has been strong over a long period of time. But you don't want to end up with a portfolio with all your eggs in one quadrant, if you like. Um, that's you know the trick to trying to ensure you're protecting yourself from sequencing risk is to ensure that at least one of your building blocks is going to perform um, in in market conditions you're not expecting. Um, and then you know sort of beyond that and talking to some of those exposures that Dave mentioned, well that, they're certainly excellent building blocks um, you know in terms of you know adding something to your portfolio, but really thinking about how they're complementing um, other other aspects of your portfolio. So, so, you know, add, adding yield um, and adding credit exposure where you have a manageable level of, of, of equity risk or understanding how that equity risk and that credit risk interact is, is really important. Excellent. Thanks, Cam, and thank you, David. Uh, probably time for one last question is, how would these strategies be implemented for clients um, by financial planners? And look, I, I can cover that one there. Um, look. Uh, yes, firstly, because uh, I'm nice way said, way after this webinar, you will be receiving the slides for this, um, as well as a, a summary of the funds and implementations flyer as well. With that as well, there's also support uh, documents around a white paper on barbell strategies. But what's also worth noting in terms of, you know, BetaShares, given that we are, you know, Australian 
uh, founded and have that Australian-centric lens on how we provide and support our financial advisors within Australia, we do have now have uh, BetaShares Portfolio Plus service as well, which is completely complementary where advisors and practices can actually provide their portfolio. The likes of uh, CAM and DB and our portfolio management team can give that a bit of a sanity or, or health check on that portfolio and actually look at where or if any of these strategies may actually benefit your client portfolio. So if that's something that you're interested in or want to use that as a part of the review period, uh, review process for any of our funds, uh, please just reach out to your uh, uh, state account manager. If you don't know who that is, please just jump on the website. There's a uh, direct contact information for, for that either by email or call, and we're happy to go through and help support you through that process. So. Uh, with that, again, thank you, David and Cam, for joining myself today. And thank you all for logging in and joining us for this webinar. I hope you found it informative. Um, as that slide before um, sort of covered before the questions, there's things to consider is obviously investment risk. There's no guarantees, future returns and outcomes are uncertain. Again, any information provided today was general in nature. But thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Enjoy your week and uh, look forward to speaking soon. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.